We all know what it's like to gaze up at the wonder of the night sky. But what if you could not only see the stars, but hear them? Matt Russo is a physics lecturer at the University of Toronto and the co-founder of System Sounds, a group that brings together science and art in order to set the universe to music. One of the things I think uh, that is so cool about your niche doing both music and astronomy is that when people think about space and sound, they might like think of the alien kind of uh, logo where it's like, no one can hear you scream in space. So could you kind of like broadly talk about what is the actual relationship between space and music and sound? Yeah, so music is all about cycles, cycles happening at different speeds. And so is astronomy right from the very beginning. It's been about the cycle of the, the daily cycle of the sun, the monthly cycle of the moon, the yearly cycle of the earth. And there's all kinds of other cycles happening in nature. And in some cases, it's possible to actually convert them into literal sound so that we can experience the, the churning and the patterns of the universe. So this is more about aligning astronom uh, astronomical concepts with musical concepts rather than actually uh, physically hearing it. That's right. So because we're separated from the universe by the vacuum of space, literal sound waves can't travel to us, but light waves can. And those light waves can tell us about the, the types of uh, rhythms and harmonies happening on faraway planets and stars. And so my job is to find a way to convert that into sound so that we can experience it. And one of the things that's just so mind-boggling about this subject is that, you know, you're doing all of these really cool sonifications talking about the orbital resonance of, of different systems, but your, your, uh, your work is part of a long-standing tradition that basically goes back thousands of years. A lot of people, even before the advent of telescopes and our modern conception of the universe, have really felt this intuition that these two areas are related. So for thousands of years, people kind of took it for granted that there was this very deep connection between music and astronomy. So they had this idea of the music of the spheres. People like Pythagoras, they thought that the, the motions of celestial bodies must be tuned in some musical configuration, and maybe if we were clever enough, we could possibly hear it someday. But for that, for thousands of years, that was that was completely accepted, right up until uh, Kepler's time in the 1600s, when we we finally turned to a more scientific understanding of astronomy. And so, what first? prompted you to begin to have these two links? So I always had these two deep passions for music on one side and astronomy on the other. And in my mind, they were completely separate. So separate that it was actually kind of like a, a life crisis for me of like, which side do I pick? Which career do I pick? Combining them really didn't seem like an option. So I knew there were these intellectual connections between orbital resonances and the ratios found in, in musical harmony. But I didn't, I didn't really get it and appreciate it until the TRAPPIST-1 solar system was found, which is the most musical solar system we've found so far. Tell me more about why that's the most musical solar system. So TRAPPIST-1 is an incredibly interesting solar system in its own right. It's got seven Earth-sized planets, and it's a very near system to Earth, so we can actually learn a lot about it. But it turns out that all seven planets are working together in an entire, a complete set of orbital resonances. So they're all adjusting their orbits to create a fixed repeating rhythm, which can also be thought of or experienced as a musical harmony. They're really like seven musicians all playing the same song. And what's special about that solar system that it ended up getting tuned that way in, in such a special way that our solar system doesn't have? That's a bit of a mystery. So our solar system planets are very, very far apart from each other. And so they didn't really have to tune to each other. They kind of don't even know the other ones exist. So that's like seven musicians playing in different rooms and different keys and different times. But the TRAPPIST-1 plants are huddled really, really close together. So they can really feel the gravitational tugs of their neighbors. And it turns out that they actually need to be very finely tuned for that system to be stable. And so the mystery is involved in how they were able to get in tune early on well, we, th we think we understand the process, but the mystery is why were they able to stay in tune when so many other systems don't. So how did you figure out 
how to translate a system like that into music. It's really the ratios of their orbits. So, for example, for every two orbits of the outer planet, the next planet orbits three times, and there's similar patterns for the rest of them. And so those are the same ratios that appear in musical harmony and in, in musical rhythms, really. And so I just had to think of the right algorithm, the right code, to take that information and turn it into something audible. So to connect it to musical sounds, like maybe a piano sound, or a drum sound, in a way that, that still lets us hear the rhythm and harmony of the system. And while our uh, solar system may be a little bit uh, discordant and messy, <laughs> Are, are there any, um, you know, like Jupiter's moon system or Saturn's moon system, do, do those have similar resonances at all or are those just as equally messy as the whole solar system? So orbital resonances are really happening all over the place in very in different situations. So three of Jupiter's inner four moons or the large four moons uh, are in orbital resonance, a very simple resonance. So one, for every one orbit of one moon, the next one orbits twice and the next one orbits four times. There's also all kinds of resonances in Saturn's rings. It's just an enormous musical instrument with all kinds of resonances with moons going on. Very complex. And then there's things like the asteroid belt, where there's certain gaps in the asteroid belt that are caused by resonances with Jupiter. And it goes on and on in, in, in other situations like the Kuiper belt. Um, Neptune and Pluto, in fact, are in an orbital resonance. So uh, it's really all over the place. What are some other things uh, in space, cosmo a cosmological phenomenon, um, that have that kind of ability to be sonified? Is it is it only orbital resonances, or do you see that everywhere? Gravitational waves are probably the best example of sonification because they happen because space-time is like a fabric, and so you can send ripples along the fabric. And it turns out that when two black holes merge, the ripples they send through that fabric are happening at a frequency our ears can hear. It's in the human hearing range. So we can't hear it with our ears because they're, they're very, very faint and they're not technically sound waves. But when we set up the detectors, the LIGO detectors that can measure these gravitational waves, you just take the output from that, connect it to a speaker, and it's something you can hear. And you can really hear two massive black holes colliding at close to the speed of light. So wild. <laughs> Um, that is, it's just really mind boggling to think about that. I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit about, uh, what an, what astronomy, uh, what astronomers can learn from musicians and vice versa. So I'd say astronomers can learn from musicians more about, um, communication. It's all about the, the connection between people and communicating on an emotional level. And that sometimes gets left out of science and astronomy. So that's something astronomers can learn from musicians and going the other way, um, maybe it's just my experience, but um, a lot of musicians and artists tend to be very inwardly focused and spend a lot of time looking into themselves and, you know, feeling feelings. That's the job. <laughs> um, so so uh, what maybe they can learn from astronomers is uh, the kind of more cosmic perspective and to, to see that the universe doesn't revolve around humans. We are just a, a part of the, the ongoing life cycle of the universe.